Hello, everybody, and welcome to Sociology of Gender, Second Week, The Social Construction of Gender. I have this uh, new program here uh, that allows me to go through the PowerPoint with my voice over it. Uh, thank you to Cassandra for pointing me here. Uh, the next step, I want to try to get one of these same programs that will do this, but will also have my face in the corner and things, kind of like Zoom, but I don't want to pay for it. So um, if any of you have any uh, um, any um, resources for me that you can point to, let me know. But um, for now, let's get to the social construction of gender. Okay, so... Let's do this. Um, we'll start this from current, current slide, the social construction of gender. Okay. So um, first of all, we're talking about the difference between sex and gender. Um, according to Margaret Anderson in Thinking About Women, uh, sex is the biological identity of a person. Who we are as males and females or intersex, that's the biological identity of a person. Gender is, uh, according to Anderson, the socially learned behaviors and expectations associ associated with men and women. That's, <coughs> excuse me, that's kind of an old definition. Um, we've been um, thinking about gender as less of a binary lately. And, uh, you know, sometimes some people are ahead of the sociologists. So Bakazin has a et al., I should say, Bakazin et al. in um, Gender Through the Prison of Difference has a different definition that you can find in the glossary there. Uh, gender is socially constructed categories that in many societies are based on a binary system that differentiates between masculinity and femininity and men and women. Recently, new gender identities such as transgender, androgynous, and genderqueer categories have been embraced and advanced. So uh, we're getting away from the binary, but I think that the binary is uh, still pretty solid in um, the institutional arrangements in society. So let's think about this, first of all. So when we talk about the socially learned behaviors and expectations, I often do an exercise in my face-to-face -face class uh, that um, I do this in my intro classes too. So some of you intro students will have um, seen this before. Um, when we make a list about what are men supposed to be like and what are women supposed to be like, and it comes down to something like this, okay? Um, Men are supposed to be masculine, tough, strong, breadwinners, handy, stoic, promiscuous, aggressive, competitive, outgoing, violent, risk-taking, logical, etc. Okay. Um, women are supposed to be feminine, emotional, expressive, domestic, chaste, submissive, dainty, cooperative, quiet, peaceful, weak, irrational, those kinds of things, the socially learned behaviors and expectations. Okay, So if you notice this, first of all, one of the first things we notice about this list is that many of them are opposites. Um, gender then is a relational concept. A change in one gender means a change in another gender. So some people have been very decentered when women have been asserting that they can too be tough and strong and stoic and competitive and outgoing and risk taking and things like that and breadwinners. Okay, some men got very decentered about this and they formed something called the men's rights movement that uh, has. Um, they argue that it is not women who are oppressed in American society; it is men, and they fight for men's rights okay so it's um yeah um i have a publication in that uh don't read it it's kind of bad so anyway read my other stuff but don't read that one okay so yet there's another thing about this is that um if we look at these just these traits, just like these categories on the left and the categories of the light, what traits are more socially valued? Is it Which traits are we more rewarded for in American society in terms of um, money, prestige, power, things like that? 
Is it being masculine, tough, strong, breadwinner, handy, stoic, or being feminine, emotional, expressive, domestic, chaste, submissive, dainty, things like that? Are we more um, rewarded for the stuff on the left or the stuff on the right? Well, it's the stuff on the left, okay, that the list on the left. So we are teaching boys and girls and reinforcing to men and women that it is better to be a man than a woman, okay? If this is the case, um, what's going to result is a sexist society, okay? And we can look at this through in our social institutions and look at social inequality. In work in the economy, in 2017, women earned 82 cents for every dollar men made. That might need a little bit of adjusting. I've also heard that it's 80.5, but still it is like, it is not 100 cents for every dollar men made. Okay. Um, the wage gap is very real. And we'll get some statistics on that later in the course. Women tend to be segregated into lower uh, paying jobs and sexual harassment affects 40 to 60% of working women. Okay. In family and intimate relationships, one in three women have been a victim of some form of domestic violence in her lifetime. Women spend on average 2.19 hours per day on household activities, while men spend 1.41 hours Okay, um, into um, government. And um, 25 out of 100 U.S. senators and 122. 102 out of 435 U.S. representatives are women, <clears throat> 9 out of 50 U.S. governors are women, and women hold 28.7% of state legislature seats in the U.S. In education, teachers tend to pay less attention to girls and women. 56% of girls in grades 12 are sexually harassed at school, um, and 20% of college women experience sexual assault. Okay. In religion, women constitute 58% of religious workers, but 18% of clergy. And in medicine and healthcare, women constitute 80% of all healthcare workers, but only 32% of physicians. So there's clear gender inequality in, um, in the United States. Okay, It's part of the institutional arrangements. Men also experience negative consequences because of the social construction of gender. Um, they tend to die earlier for several reasons. And here are some examples, and there are many more. In 2013, in single offender victim, um, single victim cases, 88% of homicide victims were males killed by other males. Okay. Um, Actually, I've got to update. It's Bureau of Justice Statistics 2014, I believe, because that wouldn't make sense. That citation would not make sense. So, um, but it's, it is from the Bureau of Justice Statistics. You see, women rarely kill each other. Um, men are more, yeah, men tend to kill other men. Now, of course, most men don't kill. Okay. But one thing about masculinity is the whole thing about not backing down. You know, um, many of these cases are something, and I don't like the term, something called victim precipitated. It means that the person who started the fight ended up being killed. So somebody, a man might start a fight with somebody else, but that man then um, pulls out a gun and shoots them. Um, those kinds of things because of this whole kind of thing of not backing down from a fight that the tension just escalates until somebody dies. Okay. In 2017, um, 36,782 men committed suicide compared to 10,391 women in spite of the fact that women attempt suicide three times as much as men. Yes, women attempt it more, men succeed more, and it's the method. Men literally kill themselves. Um, you know, they use, uh, they're more likely to use a gun. Um, suicide is, um, suicide is a male thing. Um, those of you in my intro class also remember that suicide is more likely to be committed by middle aged white men who are more likely to embrace another kind of idea of masculinity of the rugged individual. 
or individualism. It's just like you know, that a man's successes and failures are his own fault. And he's less likely to build up connections with other people or be in a community. Okay, this is for white men in particular, white middle aged men. So when life goes wrong, like a divorce or a layoff or something like that, one, they, um, they think of it as their own fault. Second, they don't have, um, you know, much social support. So um, there, that leads to an increased risk of suicide. So in Emil Durkheim's term, there's a lack of social integration and a lack of social regulation. In 2015, 11,726 male passenger vehicle drivers died in auto accidents compared to 4,750 women. In terms of blood alcohol content, 3,943 male drivers who died had a blood alcohol content of 0 0.08 or higher compared to 999 women. Okay, this has to do with risk-taking behavior. Yeah, I can drive, I'm fine, that kind of thing, you know, where like you're just going to take the risk, okay? Um, that are more likely to engage in risky behavior. And um, some of those risks end up in death, okay? So the next point when I do this exercise in class is um, we talk about how Let's go back to this. Is that is this true? Okay. Um, is it like you know? Um, are men like this? Are women like this? Well, on the one hand, it's absolutely true, and on the other hand, it's absolutely not true. This is what it means to be a human being. These are human traits. We are all masculine and feminine. We're tough and strong and emotional and expressive. We're breadwinners. We're domestic. We're handy. We're chaste and promiscuous. We're dainty. We're competitive. We're quiet. We are an amalgam of all of these traits. And they come out depending upon things like socialization, social, um, you know, um, our social institutions, our interactions, and things like that. We all have these traits within us, yet we develop some and not others. But when we um, when we do that, when we develop some traits and then like repress other traits, it leads to dehumanization. So the social construction of gender leads all of us to be less human. For example, um, you know, if a man wants to cry and feels like he can't, I tell the story often about being at my dad's funeral and not being allowed, you know, not internalizing an idea that I don't cry. And so um, I finally did on a bus, but, uh, you know, men uh, can cry if they have a good enough reason somebody has to die or something like that. But if he wants to cry, he should be able to cry. And if he, if he is not allowed to, um, you know, that dehumanizes him. And this is whether he's at a funeral or he just watched a tear jerking movie like the notebook. Okay. Uh, for women, it gets down to sexual activity. Okay. There's something called the sexual double standard that we'll talk about later in class and where like, you know, men are allowed to be promiscuous while women have to be um, chaste. And there are some derisive terms for women who um, who do not, who engage in more sexual behavior than what's allowed to. There are also derisive terms for uh, men who cry, for example. And both of these sets of terms are derogatory to women, okay? Think of the terms that you would call, uh, that one would call a man who cries in public or is weak or emotional or things like that. The terms are then like, um, that you might call them, are derisive um, to women. They can also be derisive to gay men, okay? Um, the terms uh, for women who engage in sexual activity are derisive to women, okay? Um, but yeah, if a woman wants to engage in sexual activity, why not? Okay, it's like, you know, it dehumanizes her if she cannot because a sexuality is a human thing. Okay, and sexual expression is a human thing. Um, now, you might think that um, no, neither a man or woman should cry that much or neither a woman or man should sleep around. But here's the difference. When a man cries, his gender is being challenged. That's not true when a woman cries. Okay, um, when a uh, man sleeps around, his gender is not challenged. 
when a woman does, you know, when a woman has sex, her gender is questioned. Now she can do it if she has a good enough reason, the context of marriage or at least a monogamous relationship. Okay, those kinds of things. So um, when it comes down to these different kinds of very human expressions, um, you know, there's one gender is more, um, they're watched more. They are more um, analyzed and policed around certain activities than the other gender. Okay, and it dehumanizes all of us. This is socially constructed. Okay. Um, what do I mean by it being socially constructed? Okay, Margaret Anderson says that um, we're talking about how there is um, there is a process by which gender is passed along in society. And I like this quote here: "Society, not biological difference, not not biological differences, is the basis for gender identity." Okay, so biologically, there's no such thing as gender. Gender is a social concept, okay? Um, there's, um, um, now there are some people that um, disagree with that, but before I get there, let me say like just in every single category that we have, um, as Michael Kimmel said in, um, in um, his video, that it, um, there is more variation within genders than between genders. Okay, so um, there's more variation within men in terms of, say, nurturing behavior than, um, than between men and women when it comes to things like nurturing behavior. Okay, and so what I mean also when something is uh, socially constructed is that it's not given in nature. Okay, it emerges out of social interaction. It is, um, and it is passed along in society because it becomes part becomes institutionalized. It becomes part of the normal organization of society. So we organize society by gender. And this is the only thing that's universal in terms of gender. And I'll probably get back to this too. Every society um, has a concept of gender and they organize their labor by gender. But that's it. And what... Um, and so some people disagree, and I want you to pay attention to the discussion in thinking about women on biological determinism and biological reductionism. You know, actually, I should fix that slide, too. Um, biological determinism and biological reductionism, okay, um, is... Um, you know, pay attention to that to that point there. Also, pay attention to cross cultural uh, research here. Uh, she's talking about, um, let's see, some co cross cultural uh, research. Uh, Margaret Mead in Papua New Guinea. Uh, pay attention to uh, she. Margaret Mead looked at um, at different um, groups in um, Papua New Guinea, um, different societies, and she found big differences. In, um, in gender in these different societies. In some societies, uh, women were mean and, um, and aggressive. And men in some societies, well, like the Chambuli, um, men were, um, they were, they engaged in petty gossip, were vain, and took care of the um, affairs of the home, while women were brisk and hardy. Okay. Um, Mead, uh, not Mead, uh, Margaret Anderson also talks about um, third genders. In some societies, there's third genders. She talks about hijras, H-I-J-R-A-S. She also talks about two-spirit people. She calls them berdashes. Now, pay attention to this because berdashes are, um, that is a, considered a derisive term that we are trying not to use nowadays. Um, it is... Um, it roughly translates to male prostitute. So um, there's a video that you might want to check out. Um, as they are, it's called "As They Are: Two Spirits in Two Worlds," and I'll try to post this on um, on the um, module also, so uh, you can, um, if you're interested, you could watch this. Okay, to give an idea of two spirit people um, among Native American societies. Okay, so. 
So gender also is like, uh, you know, so if you do the cross-cultural research, gender is different throughout society. And I think that that point is made very well. We can continue to make that point. And that's how you can tell if something is socially constructed. Is it true in every society? Once you find an exception, you have to think, okay, this is not part of the natural world. This is something that human beings made up. Okay. So if we look at different societies, we find big differences in gender. But as I said, every society does organize its labor by gender, but it's different. Okay. So um, it's organized differently, things like that. I also want to talk about three levels of gender. This comes from Barbara Risman from her book, Gender Vertigo. Okay. Um, the first level I want to talk about is gendered selves. This is on the individual level. Basically, it's the idea that gender resides in our personalities. Okay. It might be through socialization, which is what social sociologists are um, into, or psychological or sociobiological, but that's where gender is, is in our personalities. Gender then is what we are. Okay. The idea that socialization explains gender relates to sex role theory. Now, sex role theory is from um, a guy named Talcott Parsons, a famous functionalist, okay, who says that men perform the instrumental roles of the family, being the breadwinners, and women perform the expressive roles by taking care of the family members' emotional needs. Um, they get there because of early socialization. Uh, toys, colors, games, roles, etc., lead us to her, who we are. And this is a process, and this process is reinforced day in, day out. So girls are, um, become nurturing because they are given dolls, and boys become competitive because they are given footballs. Um, there's a really cool um, YouTube video uh, that I might post. It's called, um, it's Riley on Marketing is what it's called. And it's a good example of gender socialization. Uh, she's basically ranting about this and it's pretty cool. Okay, I might post that too. Uh, gendered social structure and gendered institutions is the institutional level of gender. Okay, this... Um, Anderson states that here that gender is not just an attribute of individuals. Instead, gender is systematically um, structured in social institutions. Okay, so gender is an organizing principle of society, and this organization uh, shapes our behavior. According to Barbara Risman, quote, uh, that many feminists, including herself, uh, uh, say that, quote, men and women behave differently because they fill different positions in institutional settings, work organizations, and families. So men and women do not behave differently so much as because of socialization, even though um, Risman admits that that's part of it, but because they are in different positions in the social structure. And this makes a certain, yeah, amount of sense, um, which I'll get to in a bit. The third one, the third concept I want to talk about, which was in your readings for this week, um, not the whole reading, but part of it, is the concept of doing gender. This is at the interactional level, okay? So we got the three I's, individual, institutional, and interactional, okay? Gender is a performance. It's um, not a fixed uh, thing. It's an accomplished um, activity that creates, recreates, and justifies um, gender inequality. This comes from Candace West and Don Zimmerman. And there's this quote I came across um, that from your readings in Gender Through the Prism of Difference, this reading on doing gender, yeah, doing gender, determining gender, um, it's on um, page uh, 73, and um, the authors are quoting um, Weston Zimmerman. The authors are Westbrook and uh, Schilt. They're quoting Weston Zimmerman as saying, quote, Neither initial sex assignment, 
pronouncement at birth as female or male, nor the actual existence of es essential criteria for that assignment, possession of a clitoris and vagina or penis and testicles, has much, if anything, to do with the identification of sex category in everyday life. What are they saying? Well, we don't really show each other our genitals when we interact. We perform our um, gender, okay? Gender is a, a performance. Remember when I said earlier said that these masculine traits are more highly valued than feminine traits, okay? Many of those traits, like being tough or caring or handy or submissive, are performative. We act that way, and we know what gender, what gender someone is by their performance. And I'm putting no in quotes, okay? So gender is a performance, and a failed gender performance can have negative consequences. I often ask my students what they would think if on the first day of class they saw me in a dress. Now, some of would think that it was cool. Others would freak out and leave. But everybody would notice that a man in a dress is something that is unusual. And it kind of like, um, it kind of like there's a certain kind of conflict there. Okay. Um, so... According to Barbara Risman, gender itself is a structure, okay, um, with these three levels, all interacting on the individual level, the interactionist level, and the institutional level. In American society, we tend to think of gender as originating in socialization because we are um, yeah, we, because we're in an individualist society, everything else follows. Risman argues that they are all intertwined and connected. And she makes a good point in saying that even if we don't want to follow the ideas of gender that we learned in early childhood, we find it difficult to change because of the institutional arrangements in, in society and the small-scale interactions. So... Yes, yeah, so we have this gender identity that we were taught like we're supposed to be, but what if we don't really embrace that? Well, we can try to not do it, but there's resistance that we have to overcome. And many times, um, many times people say, oh, forget it. I, it. It's just too, too much. Okay, I'll just do what I'm supposed to do. Um, the, um, I don't think we, um, I think that all of us conform to gender um, expectations, even when we don't want to, you know, think about like clothing and things like that. So I have this like really cool activity um, that I, um, the in-class activity that I posted having to do with if you woke up tomorrow as the opposite sex, um, how would it be different in terms of the institutional arrangements? what kinds of uh, pressures you would face in the, on the interactional level, and then how would that, you know, affect your gender identity? Um, yeah, so think about that a bit, okay? Now, 